Stephen Pinker, Harvard College Professor, Johnston Family Professor of Psychology at Harvard University. Um, you know the books. Um, uh, the Stuff of Thought, Language is a Window into the Human Nature is the most recent one. Um, before that, of course, How the Mind Works, The Blank Slate. And it is, of course, obligatory from all the pieces I've written about Steve to refer to his rock star locks. <laughs> Stephen Pinker. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Roger. Can science tell us right from wrong? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> yes, in the following sense. I have a feeling, given the makeup of this panel, that uh, given all of the debates that we've been hearing recently about science versus religion, that by science, the organizers of this panel had in mind unreligion. And I would agree that religion is, cannot tell us right for, from wrong for various reasons. For example, if we come to religious knowledge via faith, and a faith means believing something without having a good reason, I don't think that people should believe things without having a good reason. If it, If it comes from the glow of subjective certainty, if it comes from uh, scripture, if it comes from authority, those are all terrible reasons uh, to believe something. <laughs> and I think there's even a, a more uh, principled argument why uh, religion can't tell us right from wrong. Going back more than 2,000 years ago, to an argument from Plato, which I believe is still a knockdown argument today, which runs as follows. Uh, imagine someone said that, that the source of right and wrong is divine decree. Uh, killing is wrong because God said it's wrong. Well, then you have to ask, why did God say that it was wrong? Did he have a good reason? Or was it just a whim? Could he have uh, just as easily said that it's right to go out and kill and rape and torture, in which case it would be right because he said it's right? Now, if you recoil at that suggestion, if you say, no, it would still be wrong even if God said it was right, or if you say God wouldn't have commanded us to kill and rape because he had a reason not to give us that command, well, we can appeal directly to the reason and skip the middleman. Either way, <laughs> either way, wait, this is a... Uh, I have a feeling this is a non-randomly selected audience. <laughs> Either way, it's not going to be religion. There's a second way in which uh, science, by any conception, uh, uh, has, can and has told us right from wrong, because a lot of customs that we recognize today as uh, barbaric, as clearly wrong, emerged out of what we would now consider scientific ignorance. For example, every historic civilization has practiced human sacrifice. You take an innocent person, uh, you subject him to prolonged torture until he's dead. Why would so many cultures do this apparently bizarre thing that offers them no benefit? Well, all of the ancient civilizations believed in um, uh, sadistic, bloodthirsty gods. They lived their lives, they saw that it was full of nasty surprises, people died of accidents, people got sick, children got sick, uh, crops would fail. What kind of god would visit all of this suffering on humans? Well, the answer would obviously be a sadistic, bloodthirsty god. Uh, if god has a minimum daily requirement of human gore, why not be proactive about it? <laughs> better him than me. <laughs> uh, likewise, many, the primitive pre-scientific mindset believes that there are no accidents, that if something bad happens, if a ship sinks, if a crop fails, then there must have been a witch that cast a spell that caused it to happen. Uh, from that, it doesn't take long to finger someone you don't like as the witch that caused that calamity and that licenses you to, uh, to, to kill the alleged witch. We don't believe in witches anymore. One of the great moral advances, I think on a par with uh, love thy neighbor uh, and uh, <laughs> do unto others is the one on the bumper sticker, which I'll paraphrase as stuff happens.
slavery used to be justified by the empirical hypothesis that Africans were innately inferior and subservient and helpless. Uh, we know from a scientific mindset that that is incorrect and that undermines one of the justifications for slavery. Likewise, sadistic blood sports, uh, lowering a cat into a fire to uh, watch it burn to death as a form of public entertainment. We have every reason to believe that cats suffer as much as humans do, among them being that we know what makes humans suffer, namely the activity of our brain. We know that cats have brains with all the same parts, therefore we have every reason to believe that cats suffer. Uh, as Voltaire uh, famously said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. On the other hand, I don't, and here's where the, the um, no comes about. Let's say that everyone agrees on the facts that, that, for example, other people suffer, that cats suffer, and so on. But someone were to, were to say, well, uh, gruesome sadistic spectacles like burning a cat to death are okay because why should I care about a cat suffering? It gives me pleasure. Or it's fine to uh, break criminals on the wheel, which is to say strap them to a wagon wheel, smash their arms and legs with a sledgehammer, hoist them on the wheel, uh, let them die in agony, because bad people uh, deserve to suffer. What else is going to deter people from a life of crime? And besides, it's great entertainment to bring the whole family out and watch the victim uh, writhe and scream, which is how criminal punishment was administered in medieval Europe for hundreds uh, of years. Now, we realize today that that is wrong. And, uh, but on the other hand, it isn't exactly science that tells us that it's wrong, nor is it a gut feeling. In fact, cruel punishments were eliminated uh, not by appeal to religious uh, scripture, since scripture indeed mandates all kinds of cruel punishments like stoning for what we today recognize are trivial infractions like blasphemy and heresy and working on the Sabbath. So that wasn't where it came from. Uh, it didn't really come from science because there wasn't necessarily any disagreement uh, over the facts, but it did come from reason. People provided uh, reasons at the time why cruel punishments were a bad idea. For example, uh, one reason is that each of us objects to our own suffering. We, uh, if suffering is bad for me, how can I say that suffering is okay for someone else just because they're them and I'm me? It's like saying that the point that I'm standing on is a special place in the universe because I happen to be standing on it at this very moment. Well, if suffering is uh, for everyone is a bad thing, if it's bad for you, you can't coherently maintain that only my suffering counts, then the only reason that you should administer uh, suffering in a system of criminal justice is to deter uh, a greater amount of suffering that the criminal would perpetrate if he was undeterred. Well, if deterrence is the goal of a criminal justice system, you should only administer that much uh, discomfort that would deter someone, and surely locking someone up or fining him would have the same deterrent effect as smashing his uh, arms and legs and leaving him to die in agony. Moreover, if you were had a criminal justice system like every European country had until the Enlightenment, where what we would recognize as minor crimes like gossiping uh, was punishable by hideous torture or shoplifting, well, that creates a perverse incentive structure. Because if someone wants to shoplift a loaf of bread and they know that they're going to be tortured to death, well, they may as well kill the shopkeeper while they're at it uh, because there could be nothing worse than the punishment they get for stealing the loaf of bread. Why not reduce the probability of getting caught by committing the maximum possible crime? Uh, and so that is a good reason to calibrate punishment in a criminal justice system so that the worse the crime is, the more severe the punishment is. Now, these were arguments. They're not religious arguments. They're not scientific arguments. They were offered by people like Cesare Beccaria, a philosopher and uh, an economist. And that is the kind of reasoning that we use in conjunction with a better understanding of the world to tell us right from wrong, both in history and today. This kind of secular reasoning is done not just by scientists, but with the help of historians, uh, journalists, essayists, polemicists, legal scholars, uh, and moral philosophers. Now, one could say, since 
uh, there, it's really hard to find a sharp dividing line between science and many aspects of philosophy or science and social science, social science and history, history and political science. One could just say that anyone who engages in secular reason is a kind of honorary scientist that will de de define science in the broadest term of relying on logic and evidence rather than on dogma or authority or uh, subjective uh, feeling. If that was the definition of science, then I would say, yes, science can determine uh, what's right from wrong. It's not the way most people use the word science. And as long as so what people think of when they think of science is biology and chemistry and physics, I would say that science is indispensable in determining right and wrong, but it's not enough to determine right and wrong.